Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for making it through the rain. Uh, machine learning is often about extracting the signal from the noise, and I hope you can hear us through all of this noise. Um, I'm also really delighted that we have a second panel in, the row, in a row on drug discovery and drug development because so often uh, AI and machine learning is associated with primary care triage or with diagnostics. But I think in many cases, the, the most impactful space in healthcare and life sciences for AI is about how we can more efficiently and more rapidly bring precision drugs to market. So I've got a very esteemed panel uh, coming on in about 15 minutes, and, and this talk is really to give them a setup so that we can hear some very concrete examples of what machine learning really is doing um, for drug discovery and drug development. Um, so, let's see, is this working? Ah. So I work for a, um, a company called Alkin. We're funded by Google Ventures and two of Fidelity's VC funds, F Prime and Eight Roads. We're based in Paris. There are about 80 of us today, and about 60 of those 80 are geneticists, oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, and data scientists. And really, our ambition is to, is to give superpowers to researchers, researchers in academia, like George, who's coming on, uh, on the stage in a few minutes, and also researchers in, in pharma. Um, and we are building predictive models, predictive anal analytics, really to deliver breakthrough research in severe disease. Our main focus is cancer, uh, but we also work in cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, and increasingly neurodegenerative disease as well. Uh, so that's what Alkin is all about. But I want to start by introducing uh, a little bit of conceptual thinking about why machine learning has become so important in science. So. The scientific method which has carried us through for the last couple of thousand years uh, has consistently delivered because brilliant scientists have come up with hypotheses about the way they feel the world works. Uh, they've tested those hypotheses experimentally, and if those experiments uh, confirm their hypotheses and are reproducible, then the evidence goes into the evidence base and, and new science is formed. And that method, which is a kind of a reductionist method of taking complex systems and breaking them down into their component parts, has really worked wonderfully for simple systems like Newton's cradle here, uh, where you can break down the system into simple component parts and, and analyze them individually. But look at the systems that we are now attempting to understand in biology. So this is a zoom in on a fantastic map that Roche produces on their uh, biomedical pathways. It only shows about a third of the entire image. I had to shrink it to get it on one screen. And it does its best to explain in a, in a reductionist manner all of the inputs into human biology from a kind of biomechanical pathway. They also have cellular pathway map, and there are similar maps that show protein signaling, um, inflammatory systems, and the point of showing you this is there are now so many thousands and thousands of inputs that even if we could reduce uh, down the system into its component parts and we, sh we could measure the impact of those inputs on the outcomes, it would just s simply be impossible for us as human calculating machines uh, to uh, generate, to, 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 to lead with hypotheses and try to confirm the outcomes. So now um, machine learning has come along just at the right time to really deliver a very different approach, a, a kind of turning the scientific method on its head. And now what scientists are, are, are spending a lot of their time on is gathering the inputs, removing the bias from the inputs, pairing those inputs with the, bio, uh, with, with the outcomes, and allowing machines to really hypothesis generate. And, uh, and that is really a very different way of delivering science. It's a very exciting way. There's a brilliant writer and investor in California called Zavain Da, who describes this as uh, radical empiricism. So in a sense, we're moving from reductionism to radical empiricism. And I think that that is what makes machine learning so exciting and impactful for this field of life science. So I'm going to give three very concrete examples before handing over to the panel. And this image up here is an example of a very complex system. It looks like a beautiful image, but it's actually a very dark image. It's a histopathology image from one of the more terrible lung cancers called mesothelioma, which doctors in the audience will know is the cancer associated with asbestos exposure. So why am I showing that to you? Well, uh, my company, Alkin, uh, was approached by three major cancer centers in France and they, they said to us, you know, can you help us with this cancer? Um, nearly everyone with this cancer dies, but the, the, uh, the prognosis of these patients is very variable. Some live for three months, some live for three years. That makes it very hard to manage, and pathologists have consistently failed to be able to predict why. 
Um, and these cancers have to be graded through a complex process of counting cells on these H&E slides. And the hospitals asked us if we could help automate that grading system for them using image classification. And our response to that was, that's a really terrible question to ask. Why would you want to automate a system uh, to grade a tumor when the, the grading system has very limited prognostic value? The real question, which is what we convinced them to focus in on, was um, what is actually the what is the mechanism, mechanism of action of that cancer which is driving the poor prognosis of this cancer. So we built a fairly complex neural network, convolutional network architecture, which took these images and it broke them down into 30,000 little tiles, and we analyzed these tiles in parallel to each other, and sure enough, we came up with a C, in C index and an AUC, which was better than any individual or team of pathologists or existing um, algorithm on the market, and the, uh, the scientists were excited about that but not nearly as, exciting, as excited as when we reverse the telescope and we look back through the, um, the neural network from the kind of end inwards. And then we discovered something that, where the pathologists really did nearly fall over their chair. So what we asked the algorithm to do was to reveal to us the top 100 little tiles that contribute to a, a high survival um, outcome and the bottom 100 tiles that, that suggest a low outcome and, uh, and then to map those onto the regions of interest of the tumor, which you can see on the right. And uh, what the pathologists were very quickly able to see was that the biggest driver of prognosis was not in the tumor cells itself. Uh, it was in the stroma within the microenvironment and a particular feature of the stroma which was very identifiable. And that was something, new biological knowledge, which was just not known before. And for any people in drug development in the audience, uh, you will quickly be able to imagine how you can go from a kind of morphological observation to identifying a protein, which then can be drugged with a small molecule, and that's the start of a, uh, of a potential cure for this horrendous disease. So there's a very concrete example in drug discovery of how um, machine learning can help. Very different. Um, I'm showing you a picture, uh, a picture of gold from Fort Knox. Uh, I'm sure all of you know that um, in 1944, when the Second World War was really raging, uh, great leaders headed by Maynard Keynes came to Bretton Woods in America, and they came up with a new system of capital control where they pegged currencies to gold. And that system lived with us into the mid-70s, uh, and, and it gave us the, the name the gold standard. And in life sciences, we have a gold standard, uh, and that gold standard is the randomized control trial. And randomized control trials have delivered uh, countless cures and relieved enormous human suffering over the decades and generated hundreds of billions of dollars of value. But much like gold uh, became not sophisticated enough to handle uh, the, the complexities of uh, financial markets, the gold standard and the control arm is also becoming uh, perhaps faded glory in some aspects of healthcare. It won't disappear completely, but there are some areas of healthcare where the gold standard is no longer sufficient. So if you look at the randomi randomized control trial and how it works and why it works, what happens is you have an experimental arm, which is the arm of a trial uh, that you're using to test the experimental drug. And you look at the average effect size of that experimental arm versus the average effect size of a control. And the people on the control arm are normally having a placebo or they're, or they're going through standard of care. And you power the trial with enough patients to ensure that uh, you can be confident that the effect of the experimental drug um, is causing the difference between the two trial arms and not an exogenous factor. And if you're confident in that power and if the effect size is big enough, then sure enough, the drug can be regulated, and if it's safe, it can get to market. So that's the principle of randomized control trials. But the challenge is it's really dealing with average effect sizes. And average effect sizes don't do much for doctors these days when they're in front of patients. Patients don't want to know what the average effect of a drug is on them. They want to know what the precise effect of that drug on them personally is going to be. And of course, in precision medicine, particularly in cancer where we're stratifying cohorts down to individual patients or small subgroups based on biomarkers, it's increasingly important that we have precision trials for precision medicine. And again, deep learning has a lot to say in that space. So to give you an example, imagine if, you, if instead of having a control arm of patients, um, you instead looked into retrospective data and you could take real world data. And you model retrospectively, sorry, you, you model on that retrospective data patients going through the standard of care who would have been on the control arm in a randomized control trial. 
And if you can get a model which generalizes well and can get a very high sensitivity and specificity, then potentially that counterfactual, the idea that they are on, the, on standard of care rather than the experimental drug, can be used as a model to compare to the experimental arm. So instead of half the people on your trial being on a control arm, which is deeply frustrating for those patients, uh, knowing that they're on a legacy uh, drug, um, we can instead build a digital twin, which Maria mentioned earlier today. We can build a digital twin who is on the counterfactual drug, the control arm, and we can power the trial that way. Uh, and so if you think, of the, think about the benefits here, this means that potentially 50, only 50% of the people have to be on the trial and all those patients get the experimental arm. Um, uh, because we have more predictive value, we can power the trial with actually a lower number of patients. And one more very important factor is that in order to be disciplined traditionally to make uh, control arms as similar as possible to the experimental arm, um, trial designers include a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria, which is a very sensible design principle, but unfortunately it means it excludes a lot of patients who would benefit from the drug. And we can have a far reduced uh, set of uh, exclusion criteria if you use counterfactual trial arms instead because you're really drawing patients from the real world and it means you can have a, a less curated experimental arm which are more ref reflective of patients in the real world. So we're working with regulators at the moment to work out uh, which, which, um, which trial settings are, are best to test this new approach and it's, it's entirely based on, on machine learning. Last example, this is slightly moving away from um, drug development and drug design, but it tackles the question of how do we get all of this data uh, in order to inform our neural networks and our, our, uh, our algorithms. So not only do we need high volume of data uh, to, to power these, uh, um, these algorithms, but we also, as has been said in the previous panel, we need heterogeneous data, because really from heterogeneous data, that's how we find the signal from the noise. Um, and it's a very challenging thing to, to gather large volumes of high quality heterogeneous data when you're doing it in the traditional way. So the traditional way is pooling data into one database. So if your human data is from three hospitals, as shown here, you put it all into one database uh, and, and you run your algorithms there. Now that's a challenge for many reasons. Patients don't like their data to leave hospital firewalls. Hospitals don't like to let go of their data. Information governors certainly don't like their data to leave firewalls, especially uh, crossing international boundaries. And this data is big, physically big. It's hard to move around. Uh, so Alcan have innovated a, a new architecture um, called federated learning. And the way federated learning works is that we put big NVIDIA GPU stacks, big servers behind hospital firewalls. We attach the data sets locally and we have a clever orchestration engine which allows the algorithm to travel from hospital to hospital, training in a batch-wise manner. And, uh, and we've shown that without any statistical loss, we can train an algorithm centrally, but without removing a single pixel or a genotype or a phenotype from that, from that um, from behind the firewall. So it's a wonderful way of protecting patient privacy, which I think is an increasing issue uh, as we get uh, to more and more high dimensional data, which is uh, easier to uh, nefariously re-identify if, if, if you get your hands on it. Uh, but it's also, it also creates a great business model because the way we work with hospitals is we, we revenue share back to hospitals based on the number of data points they, they contribute to our models. So those, those are three very concrete examples of, of how we're gathering data and then using data to improve drug discovery and drug development. And we really believe that predicting is the future of life sciences. We think that increasingly pharma companies are going to be building predictive models uh, in every stage of their pipeline from research from discovery through to regulatory approval and, and post-market subgroup analysis. And we're super excited to be part of that value chain. We've got some great competitors in this space. Uh, it's, a, it's a blue ocean. Pharma, the pharma industry are just getting their head around uh, how they can work with uh, players like ours. And it's really exciting to see it moving at such pace. So that's my introduction. Maybe I can invite Barbara onto the stage who will introduce the panel. So thank you very much indeed, Parker, for that absolutely inspiring talk. Um, so we're now going to have a panel discussion about hacking human biology, the, the power of predictive AI in life science and drug R&D. So I suspect we are going to mention AI a few times more in this, in this panel discussion. Um, I'd like to invite the rest of the panel to come up, and they're all going to introduce themselves. And I'm going to sit uh, down with them. Right. 
So, um, George, do you want to start by introducing yourself? Yes, of course. Um, so, my name is George Cardozo. I'm a professor at King's College. Um, I do a lot of research in AI, mostly uh, within healthcare settings, uh, working on real-world data. And I'm also the CTO of the new uh, London AI Center for Value-Based Healthcare, where we're using technologies such as what Parker just described, federated learning, to be able to learn across multiple hospitals in South London and aggregate really large amounts of data. Hi, my name is Paulina and I'm a senior research scientist at Encilica Medicine, leading the biomarker development team. At Encilica, we are focused on early stage uh, preclinical drug discovery. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Oliver Backhouse. I'm responsible for strategy uh, for precision medicine and genomics uh, at AstraZeneca um, and uh, the application of AI uh, and machine learning in both of those uh, areas. So hi, my name is Barbara Domain Heyman. Um, I'm an entrepreneur in residence at the Francis Crick Institute, um, but I'm also I have a background in, in kind of traditional biotech, if you like. Um, I've come relatively recently to this exciting new world of where data science meets biomedical science in uh, working with Paul Dowling to help run the KQ Labs, which is a new accelerator that we've uh, just done the first cohort at the Crick. Uh, I think some of them are in the audience. Um, and just a quick shout out, be, we'll be doing another uh, uh, cohort for that uh, and we'll be opening up ap applications in the summer. So startups actually focused in the data science meets biomedical science area. Um, so Parker, is there anything else you'd like to add by way no. of introduction? I think they know me now. <laughs> okay, so let's plunge in then. So in your presentation you mentioned that actually hypothesis generation using neural network networks is really disrupting the scientific method. So do you think that means that scientists are going to basically play a different role? Are we, are we still going to need scientists in the traditional sense? Okay. Thank you for asking that question. And to be very, very clear, we definitely still do need scientists. But you might ask yourself why. So today we can uh, beat chess and we can beat games like Go without chess players and Go players informing that. And there's a very simple reason for that, which is we know the rules of chess and we know the rules of Go. Um, so you can have um, adversarial networks who essentially play each other uh, and through brute force over millions of iterations, infer the rules of chess and then, and then learn how to play it better than anyone else. The challenge in biology is we don't know the rules of biology at all. Uh, and it's, I think, increasingly clear that the, 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 the um, rules of biology are more and more exotic as you look into it. So potentially, hypothetically, if we had infinite human data, we could infer the rules of biology. But in fact, we have very limited human data, and the data that exists is very noisy. So for sure today, we do need um, scientists. And uh, if any of you are invited to work with data science companies trying to make progress in this space where uh, they don't have um, scientists, and biologists, doctors on board, I would be very skeptical about them. Oliver, uh, would you like to talk a little bit about how you're working in AstraZeneca? Yes, of course. Um, and I think Parker made some really good points about uh, the you know, randomized controlled trials uh, and the, the kind of uh, impact that we can have. Um, yeah, maybe just to say a word about AstraZeneca. I mean, we're really focused on science. Uh, we're focused on pushing the boundaries of science to develop uh, life-changing medicines. I mean, that's really the, the, the purpose of the, of the company. Um, Precision, uh, maybe just to say a word about precision medicine and diagnostics. I mean, they're, they're both central to the activities of the company. So precision medicine for us means targeted therapies and, and identification of biomarkers that Parker talked about. And, and it's, it's companion diagnostics. So, uh, so uh, they're diagnostics that are necessary for the label of the medicine. So it's not sort of point of care, uh, you know, in a, in a uh, sort of GP's office. I mean, it's, it's used in a clinical trial to stratify patients and ensure that we get the right medicine to the right patient at the right time. So maybe that's, that's perhaps a word about precision medicine. Genomics is, is much earlier stage, so it's, it's really still a discovery science for us. Um, and uh, I'd say, um, you know, the, the kind of key drivers of genomics are, 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 are the explosion in, a, in access to genomic data. And, uh, but we're at, we're, we're, we're at a much earlier stage in terms of the application of of, uh, of AI machine learning to, uh, to genomics. So I mean, what you just said about um, actually using precision medicine and actually using biomarkers in your trials, and that obviously is going to very much limit the label that you get, the actual population that you are allowed to treat once you get the drug approved. I mean, that represents a, a seismic shift in terms of pharmaceutical companies' attitudes because traditionally they would basically want to go for a blockbuster 
and yeah. to segment as little as possible. So, I mean, talk a little bit about how, that, how that's changed over the last few years. And, and actually, I mean, I think not, some companies are moving faster than others in, in that space. Yes, and we, we spoke a bit about that just before the panel, and it, it came as a, sh a bit of a shock for me to hear you, you say that. So I'm probably a bit conditioned in AstraZeneca that, that that's just the way we do things now. So um, uh, I think probably in 2011, 2012, we went through a shift. So we were uh, a, a primary care-focused uh, organization. Uh, but we've shifted our focus to specialty care and oncology, and alongside that, you know, precision medicine is, is absolutely critical to, uh, you know, identifying patient uh, types, patient subtypes, and ensuring, I mean, uh, ensuring that our medicines are, are effective, so, you know, and, and some of the biomarkers, you know, EGFR, you know, with a T790M mutation, BRCA, so ovarian cancer, uh, breast cancer, uh, PDL1, uh, so in, in immuno oncology. I mean, those are some of the key biomarkers that are uh, that, that help us, you know, stratify the, the patients, uh, you know, uh, uh, most effectively. Mm -hmm. Great. So, George, uh, tell us a bit more about what you're doing in your in your work with. with uh, yes, of course. Um, so, our plan is to. Basically, the ultimate thing that we want to do is to be able to attract knowledge from multiple hospitals at the same time. Um, so hospitals, different hospitals in the country and throughout the world have completely different levels of digital maturity. Uh, that basically means you need to build um, appropriate infrastructure in hospitals, both on the hardware side, compute, and on the software side. So basically the software stack that is going to take data that sits in hospitals within different patient healthcare records, PACs, RIS, etc. aggregate that data, harmonize it, and make that data searchable and queryable at scale. And if you do that within each hospital and you harmonize that layer, what you can then do is build a network, a federated network that sits on top of that, that where you can send algorithms to inside of different trusts, learn from data in a privacy preserving way without any problems of governance, and be able to retrieve those models that contain the knowledge that you gain from it. And if you think about it, that's basically how medicine is taught in this country. You have a clinician that when gets trained, it goes to hospital A, learns some bit, goes to hospital B, learns a little bit more, goes to hospital C, and etc. And the fact that they can see different patient populations, different patient presentations, different ways of doing medicine is very enriching. Is it, it allows them to get the noise, get the signal from the noise, right? And that's exactly what we're trying, to, uh, what we want these algorithms to do. We don't want them to over-specialize on a specific hospital. We want them to become really general purpose and understanding this, um, this, this combination of factors that really influence the way we care for patients. So can you give us some more examples of some insights that you and your teams are actually trying to get from, from these data? So it, it, it really depends. So, so there's five areas that we are looking at mostly. They're really broad. Uh, I mean, when we think about AI in healthcare, we normally think about diagnosis and prognosis. That's just a tiny little world. Uh, auditing is really, really important. Knowing what's happening in your trust now is really important. Uh, areas such as actually improving the efficiency of clinical care is very important. Uh, improving the way that we care for patients from a purely hospital management and operational point of view. So knowing how many beds you have available and when patients might not at attend their appointments. Things like this can completely change the way you care for patients. Um, but our primary goal is really the idea, and that's the name of the center, the, AI, the, the London AI Center for Value Based Healthcare. The primary goal is this idea that we should be optimizing healthcare for long-term long outcomes and minimization of costs, even if it means spending more money now, as long as in the future we can save money and maximize uh, the, the, the outcomes and quality of life of patients. So it's looking at different clinical pathways and data at scale to be able to look at care holistically end-to-end. Great. So, I mean, you've, you've talked interestingly about how you're using federated learning. So, Parker, you tantalizingly referred to this during your talk um, in terms of business model and how you're actually approaching federated learning from a business model perspective and actually allowing um, basically hospitals to get revenues as a result of the data that they're providing. Is that, is that what, what I understood yeah. correctly? Yes, that's correct. I'm very lucky to be sat almost next to George in the, in the KCL uh, labs, uh, which is a very nice place to be. And, uh, and the, we have kind of two core values. One, that you should, you should protect patients' privacy by keeping their data behind the firewall. But two, that hospitals who do all the hard work of actually gathering this data should participate in the value chain. So it's very straightforward. We've actually built a blockchain architecture for, which actually helps us, tra uh, for traceability purposes, track all of the data that goes into our neural networks. But that also has a side effect of allowing us for reimbursement reimbursement purposes to prove to the hospitals how much data they've contributed into models, which when, when, then when we monetize with pharma, 
this is of course all anonymous data, um, we, the, the hospitals get uh, revenue share based on the number of data points they've contributed. And what about, I mean, presumably not all data points are necessarily, um, I mean, they're, they're obviously equal, but some data sets might be cleaner than others, some data sets may be better quality than others. I mean, how would you take that into account with your, with your, with your model? So um, if you're asking do we assign different value to different data points to, based on their, their uh, uh, scientific value and their kind of cleanliness, no, no, we don't. That's okay. one level of okay. complexity we haven't dipped into yet. M maybe in the future. I mm. hope not. <laughs> okay, well, that's a really interesting new yes, approach. Yes, Yeah. Paulina might know about that. Great. Well, so moving on to Paulina now. So obviously you're switching gears a bit here, and uh, we've talked a lot about patient stratification, um, but you're applying um, AI to a different area, which is more around actually drug discovery and drug design. Yes, so, so we work on the areas where yeah. when you have to develop drug before you actually give it to humans, so you have to ensure it's effective and you have to ensure it's safe. And we use um, AI to first screen for huge libraries of compounds, which is like usually a standard way of doing this. In, in pharma, you have huge libraries of compounds. You try to find the one that are most active one, and then you optimize them from that. Uh, but we also uh, developed a new approach uh, when we use uh, genes of adversarial network and adversarial autoencoders, so genes of modeling, uh, when you can have an algorithm that will imagine new molecules from scratch with desired set of property. And from that, uh, we went into the animal studies with those molecules and we fully validated them in vitro and in vivo and we showed they're active. So we're right now uh, ready to enter a phase one clinical trials with those candidates and we're really excited about that because it's been quite a few years with a lot of companies talking about that, yes, we can use AI in drug discovery, but I think this year will be the first year when we can actually show, yeah, this is a drug that's been fully developed with AI, which is super excited for all of us. Fantastic. That's great. So um, moving on perhaps to, um, well, let's talk a little bit about um, genomics then. So, mm. so you talked a little bit about this, Oliver, at the beginning. So you think that's earlier on in, in the journey? Yes, and uh, maybe, maybe just to make one point in response mm. to Polina, I yeah. think one of the challenges, because maybe we get on to challenges mm, in a second, yeah, but absolutely. one of the challenges is, uh, is the fragmented nature, uh, at least, at least in, a, in a said, the fragmented nature of the sort of AI uh, machine learning groups mm. across, across R&D. And, and you know, a number of our competitors have, have hired uh, on their executive committee level you know, they've hired uh, heads of AI uh, data. And I think, uh, you know, that's an important step to uh, kind of bringing, uh, you know, the fragmented nature of the data t together. Um, yeah, so I, I was on genomics, I, I was going to mention a couple of things uh, on, on what's driving the, the, the growth in, in, in the data set, you know, the, the growth in genomics. And, and it is the, uh, the massive reduction in cost. So uh, first, first genome was sequenced, it was three. Uh, billion dollars, I think it was, and it took 10 years. You know, now it's a couple of hundred dollars and it takes maybe 10 minutes. I mean, that, that is a fundamental driver of, of, of change in terms of, in terms of sequencing um, accessibility. So, uh, so I say that's, that's probably the key driver, um, along with, uh, we talked a bit about access to data, so along with consent, mm -hmm. so patient consent and having a broad uh, consent, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of ag uh, agreed. Um, in, terms of, in terms of AI machine learning, um, you know, the advantage is that the data is, is structured. You, uh, there's, there's a lot of it. It's, it's, it's structured uh, data in genomics. But, but uh, again, I'd say, and I, th I think we've built one of, the, um, one of the leading capabilities in, in the world, not just in pharma, but across any industry in terms of data processing and ingestion. Uh, and you look at the massive volume now coming out of the UK Biobank and all of us at the Broad and, and, and the Sanger. Um, uh, but we're, we're still at early stages in terms of uh, proof of concept application of uh, machine learning to, you know, to these, you know, huge data sets. But it's moving, you know, it's moving very quickly. And, and you know, one, one of the issues as well is talent and, and access to talent. And, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've hired, uh, you know, we've, we've hired uh, specialized talent in order to, you know, to, to, to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. So you feel that uh, imaging is an area where, in patient, where, where you're more likely to get an impact more quickly 
for actually for patients? Yeah. So f yeah. So for us, genomics is really at the at the early stage of discovery science, and and is as yet unproven in terms of you know exactly how it's going to deliver mm -hmm. for for drug development. I mean, we've we've identified our first target, uh, you know, as a result of that, but it's still early stages. No, I mean this. Th what perhaps what I'll say next is a bit controversial, but I, but I'll almost say in the image analysis space, machine learning is, is almost commoditized. It's almost commoditized. So, you know, I was, I was at ASCO, and if anybody was at ASCO, the, uh, the big oncology conference in Chicago last week, and I was with all the, uh, you know, uh, Path AI, Page AI, Deep Lens, you know, all, all of the uh, image analysis uh, AI companies. And I think, you know, the challenge for them is differentiating their, their AI and their algorithm uh, you know, um, uh, you know, within that space, because because it, it felt to me a bit like it was starting to become commoditized. The, the challenge was much more around regulatory quality, GCP compliance. That w those were more the issues than actually the technology around the AI. I mean, that's amazing that to, to say that a technology which which really has hasn't really reached the market. I mean, it's still not really being used in anger that much yet. Is is commoditized? I mean, that's amazing. So there's obviously so much competition already um, I mean is that how can we be confident about the robustness of the algorithms that are being used to to analyze those those images well we, we need we need trials I mean we, we definitely mm. need to see more more data um, and a couple of the examples we looked at I mean I think lung is relatively relatively straightforward in the cancer space uh, you know we, we're running a trial with with one of those companies in bladder uh, and it, it comes down to, to sort of sell Identification. So cancer cells generally are, are you know, are, are easier to to identify through through AI algorithms. But immune cells are much are much tougher right now. Um, so yeah. So w uh, I mean, a number of the companies have run extensive trials, you know, comparing their technology to pathologists. And coming back to to Parker's point about do we do we need scientists? I think we probably do. I, mean, I don't know if there are any pathologists in the room. I think we probably do need still need pathologists. But honestly, the uh, the horizon around um, how long AI is an augmentation to pathologists versus a replacement didn't seem like it was too far away to me. Really? So you, you think pathologists will, but they'll be just doing different things, won't they? They'll be doing in, the interesting bit, mm -hmm. actually interpreting what, what you need to do as a result of the, um, the image analysis. Uh, honest, I, I mean, again, yeah. I, I, this is a controversial view, <laughs> and I hope I'm not uh, uh, sort of offending anybody in the audience, but yeah, of, of course, as an augmentation right now, but I mean, the, the technology is developing so quickly, and that you know, I, I mean, we, we train some algorithms live in in the room, and uh, you know, the accuracy is already better than pathologists. So yes, yeah, so as an augmentation for now, but I don't know, it didn't seem like it was too far away that uh, that it would be a replacement. Well, if I could add to that, I mean, I, I think that the characterizing the kind of man versus machine. Um, uh, debate is a kind of forced dichotomy. Um, you know, data science is a world where there are a lot of competitions and we, we've been informed by um, participating in a lot of uh, competitions in image and in multimodal analysis and one, one competition that we won recently uh, was uh, we, we only took a, um, about a hundredth of the data that was available to us and we built an algorithm based on that because we wanted to show that by working with uh, neural networks but also with pathologists we could uh, get a higher sensitivity and specificity from a much smaller data set. And so what we had was we, we had human pathologists uh, <coughs> labeling the data, not in a, in a very detailed way, but just very quickly um, indicating on, on pathology images where the region in, of interest was most likely to be. Uh, so it, it took about 15 seconds per slide. This was not a high labor intensive thing. And we did that for about 1,000 slides, so this was not a, a large time sink. And we showed that we could get uh, to a higher sensitivity or specificity than a completely uh, unlabeled set of data where there was literally a thousand times the amount of data. So I think, you know, really the kind of graceful interface of humans and, and machines are where things will be. And, and then to the second point of commoditization, I would agree with you that image classification is getting more, certainly more mature. Uh, what is more complex is multimodal analysis, what we focus on at Alkin. So it, it's very clear that, um, particularly in cancer, that um, the combination of molecular biology um, and not just looking at a single cell, but also looking at it in a spatial context, which can be done with mass spec imaging, combining that information uh, with, with imaging, radiomics, um, pathology, and also importantly, including the time series um, in that mix is going to be the key to unraveling a lot of these 
diseases. And that's a, that's a much more complex data science challenge that I think is certainly not commoditized yet. It's something that George has been working on a lot, so he can probably tell you more technical detail. And actually, maybe if I could just build on uh, uh, Parker's comment just briefly, one of the things that we're really focused on is, is early detection, you know, early <laughs> detection of disease. And a lot of things that Parker's talked about, you know, will will uh, sort of, uh, you know, help that. So just mm -hmm. to support really what Parker was saying. Yeah, George, do you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I think the part that is really interesting is that when you move into, into the actual healthcare domain on, on, on care delivery, a lot of the tasks that are currently done by clinicians can be better automated by algorithms. I think that's already happening now. And the reason is not present in hospitals is because we don't really know how to deal with the legal ramifications of that who has ownership of mistakes and all of these issues. Mm -hmm. It's not the algorithms that are failing, it's, 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 it's actually the legal framework and governance framework and safety frameworks around it. Um, but also as Parker was saying, it, it is the, 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 the complexity now starts at the point of combining multiple sources of data. So one of the main things that we're trying to do when we're looking to this value-based healthcare perspective of, of data is every single piece of data that is acquired of a patient from the time that they get admitted to being discharged, maybe three years down the line, being cured or something like that, all of, all of those pieces of information should be informative for your next prediction. And combining multiple sources of information in a way that is sequential, where you can always be the most update you can be with the minimal risk possible, that's extremely complex to do. And for that, you need really huge amounts of data. If we're talking purely about diagnosing an image, fine, that, that, that can be done. We can do that. That's not, that's not really a big issue. So, I mean, let's move on to, I mean, how, how are we going to get this all adopted? Yeah. Because obviously that's, um, I mean, all this technology is amazing, but we've got to get it actually approved. So um, tell us a bit more about how you see the regulatory pathways here, because obviously we need to bring the regulators with us in our thinking and, and, and actually yeah. get this accepted and used by patients as quickly so, as possible. So I, I think one of the big issues that we have, and definitely regulators need to advance in the way that they think about AI and how it's applied in healthcare, but I think we also as researchers and innovators need to rethink the kind of impact we want to do. Uh, healthcare systems are tremendously inefficient at the moment, and there's many types of uh, changes that can they, they can undergo without having necessarily a direct impact in patient care. For example, if I'm able to predict uh, how many beds are available in a trust or uh, if patients are going to miss their appointments or not, I could probably increase the efficiency of a trust by 10, 12%, maybe even 15%. That can release a huge amount of money for other things. If I can have systems sitting on the back just looking at medical decisions and maybe highlighting when they think a clinician has made the wrong decision and say this should be seen by a second independent clinician, purely as a safety system, mm -hmm. that's tremendously helpful and it will not change yeah. care because they're still being cared in the mm -hmm. same way. We need to pace what we want to do and how, how this information is being used to care for patients so that we also give the confidence to the trust themselves that we're doing the right thing with data and that our predictions are valuable. And only when they gain that trust, they will start adopting these methods at scale, I think. So that's really interesting. So what you're basically saying is that you, there's a lot that can be done without having to get any yeah. kind of regulatory approvals and yes. actually build the trust in the, in the algorithms, in, in the way of working. Yeah. And then, I think that's a, that's a really interesting approach, yes. Paulina, do you want to Yeah, I want to on comment that? on that, yeah. probably, again, uh, show that we have a lot of positive examples. So, since January 2017, FDA approved 14 AI-based devices, and the, in each case, it was a fast-track approval. So, they recognize the potential, they can see the accuracy, and it was done. So, one of the recent approval was the um, uh, Apple iWatch um, detection of atrial fibrillation. So, it's already on market, we have it, so I have it on my, on my wrist, right. so we can right. use it already. <laughs> which is really exciting. And uh, I think most of the people criticize um, machine learning approaches because they think of them as a black boxes that we can't interpret. But I think if we run clinical trials on them, so we test them in a clinical setting, and we show that they're effective in predicting, they can predict safety, efficacy of drugs, and so on, we can still use them. You don't need to understand this. If you ask a doctor how like a lab machine works, they will never tell you that. They don't know themselves. So why we need to interpret uh, AI approaches for them if they've been tested in the clinical setting. So I think this is the way of doing this. And FDA clearly recognized the potential and probably other European agencies will also catch up soon. Yeah, and I think there was an interesting paper published by the discussion paper published by the FDA quite recently, which yes, actually yeah. uh, looked at the aspect of you know how often, obviously real world learning, 
AI is constantly learning and improving and updating, and that rather goes against the fact that you approve a particular device with a particular fixed set of data yeah. because you're constantly building on that data. So they will have to change yes. it. So they're trying to figure out, I guess, where is the boundary of how much additional improvements are within the original concept and what actually constitutes constitu something new that has to be re-approved. Yeah, I would like to add that I, I think that actually regulators uh, in this case are moving quite fast uh, and particularly the FDA I'm very impressed with their approach as you mentioned Polina um, I think what is holding us back is public trust and in some case fear of Daily Mail headlines um, and, uh, and, and I, really, I really do hope that changes quickly I mean if you look at another domain um, I can't remember how many hundreds of thousands of uh, car crashes there are in America every year but if autonomous driving reduced that from say half a million to 200,000, you know, we're not going to get 300,000 thank you letters, we're going to get 200,000 court cases. And so if your benchmark is perfect, you're never going to innovate at all. Um, I feel particularly strongly about the use of machine learning in risk stratification of disease because there are already many treatments out there that could be used preventatively uh, that are just not being uh, deployed today. So Jack mentioned earlier my daughter who ultimately died at the age of eight on a CAR-T therapy, but she was born with a germline mutation called FOX2B which uh, would have uh, easily been picked up uh, in, a, in a whole genome uh, screen at birth. And if she had been caught at birth, uh, we could have used a, a quarterly urine test that would have cost about 50 pence per test. Um, and she would have been uh, identified with an elevated catecholamine count probably in the first few months of her life. Um, in the end, by the time she was diagnosed at extreme stage four, her catecholamine count was, I think, over 2,000 times the average uh, for a child of her age. So, you know, th there, there are real treatment, and, and if she had been caught at stage one, most certainly we could have uh, imaged, removed the tumor, and, and she would be alive today. So there really are treatments and screens that are absolutely available now and affordable today, and we can bring these to market. Um, I think we, you know, this is courageous science, there's certainly courageous patients, and I think we need to be uh, bold, responsible, but bold in our approach to, to bringing these treatments to market. Absolutely. And, uh, okay, well, that's probably a good point to maybe talk a little bit more about the ethics um, considerations. I mean, who would like to talk first a little bit about, about the ethics? I mean, I think, George, you've, you've yeah, got I'm, some... I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to. Um, so when you're talking about hospital data, obvious, obviously it's a very touchy subject. As, 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 as has been said before, no one wants to be in the Daily Mail. Um, but it really depends on what you want to do with the data. So if your primary aim is to be able to treat patients and be able to uh, optimize clinical service, you can actually use the data now with very little uh, work. Because if that's your primary aim, you actually have a legal basis to use the data. It's being used, the, your, your clinicians use your data to treat you, so that's fine. It becomes a question when you're talking about pure research and what are the outcomes of research. And, and, and at that point is where you need to bring patients in. So really the idea of healthcare data access is do everything you do in the most open way possible with patients in a room, involve your colleagues at Guardians, involve your patient representative groups, explain what you're doing, get their feedback, try to understand what they're comfortable and not comfortable with, and try to push that boundary so that you can do the research that you need to do with appropriate safe, uh, safe, um, safety around everything that, you, that you're, you're, you're basically doing. The governance itself is relatively simple if you follow procedures such mm -hmm. as uh, federated learning. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, um, all the ethics are, I mean, they're non-trivial to get, but you can get them. That's not an issue. It's really about having public trust mm -hmm. that what you're doing is being done properly and that their data is never at risk and they will not suffer the consequences of that in the future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Oliver, is there anything you want to add from a, from a major pharma perspective around mm -hmm. about ethics and, and patient confidentiality? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, just to say that we, you know, to my observation, I mean, we're very, very conscious of it. I mean, it's absolutely mm -hmm. critical. Uh, I mentioned the consents mm -hmm. before, so, you know, so being very clear about what consents are, um, uh, are, are granted. Uh, you know, we have internal, you know, strict internal data privacy uh, uh, compliance guidelines. Um, GDP, GDPR is, is a bit of an issue around personal data. Uh, I've run into that issue in, in terms of the difference between, between the EU and the US uh, in some of the institutions that we work with. Uh, so some of the US institutions are 
uh, you know, don't want to be or unwilling to, to be bound by, by GDPR regulation. So that's, that's maybe an issue. Um, and also the classification of what is personal data. Just, there's just a definitional thing and, and, and a question around exactly where you draw the line and at what stage it becomes de-identified and, and at what stage it isn't. That's particularly true of genomic data, which you know, there isn't anything more personal than someone's genomic data. Indeed, yes. Well, I think we've, we've covered quite a lot of ground in terms of, of AI applied to this important area. I mean, we've covered um, around, uh, well, obviously, Paulina, you work in the area of target discovery and small molecule drug design, if you like, so that end of the spectrum. We've talked a lot about um, actually patient stratification so, and precision medicine, uh, whether in clinical trials. I mean, you, you alluded to some really interesting approaches to clinical trials, which I think will be quite revolutionary. Um, and then actually applying to, to uh, whole cohorts of patients once, once the drugs are approved. So we've covered those sort of broad areas. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of startups in the room. What, what areas, what, what, what would you like startups to be doing and focusing in on to support this area further? If, if I start with that, there's one thing I would like to say to the data scientists in the room, and I think it's very important. Um, we you know, we're in a, a brand new industry which needs to demonstrate its, its value and its reputation uh, to large pharma. And it's important that we are responsible with our data governance. And there are some disciplines that I think are maybe unevenly distributed within the data science world. So a little bit nerdy, but very important things like make sure your test data doesn't slip into your validation data sets. Uh, uh, P-hacking, the data scientists will know what I mean. I think it is extremely important to be um, disciplined and traceable in your data science practices because what we really don't want is a kind of Theranos style scandal uh, within the data science world where uh, suddenly uh, we're all beaten over the stick because someone's been ill-disciplined and it's quite hard to monitor that kind of thing from the outside. We've introduced some blockchain technology to, to establish uh, that our own data uh, is used um, kind of from in, in a data ethics way and I think we all need to consider that carefully. Mm -hmm. What else would we like to see from startups? I, I would say that startups should be working on something that humans can't do. I think we are now past the point where we are trying to replace uh, human tasks. So for example, if you're talking about diagnosing from an image, humans can probably do that well. And if humans can do well, algorithms will very likely be able to do the same thing very soon, if that's what you're talking about. But starting to think about what humans wouldn't be able to do, even if they had an infinite amount of time. For example, the field of radiogenomics is a great example of that, where you can predict with quite significant accuracy what is the likely genotype of a certain uh, tumor given an image that you see. That sounds a bit far-fetched, but you can really keep pushing this. You can talk about predictions, long-term predictions. You can do uh, in silico trials where you try to simulate what if you were to do treatment A or treatment B, what would have happened to the patient in the long term. Those are things that clinicians, even the best clinicians in the world, will be very, very unlikely to be able to predict. And that's where I think most of the value is currently in healthcare, at least mainly for startups that are starting now. Great. So I think uh, we've just got a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to ask the panel very, very quickly to say, basically, what, what do you think is your favorite opportunity in this area and what's your biggest concern? So just very rapid fire. I'm very excited about adaptive trials. Uh, I'm particularly excited for uh, horrendous diseases like glioblastoma where typically patients only have one shot on goal uh, that if we, we use things like liquid biopsies to quickly assess poor responders um, and then use uh, um, predictive analytics to predict other pathways that they can move on to fast so that they can get another shot of treatment rather than having to wait for the, the typical endpoint, which is death. Brilliant. And your, your, your biggest concern? Uh, it was the one I mentioned before, ill-discipline, okay. bringing disrepute yeah. to our market. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, right. Oliver. Yeah, I mean, I'm most excited about this just incredible uh, explosion in genomic uh, data. And, you know, we've, we've started analyzing it. It's the first time in, in human, human history this, this has been available. And it's already throwing up some incredible uh, kind of results. So that's the bit I'm most excited about. Uh, I think the bit I'm most concerned about, it's a bit boring, but uh, kind of legal departments. Uh, one of the uh, big frustrations at working with startups and academic institutions is, the, is, is that that's often the rate limiting step. You know, it's not resourced, uh, the, the expertise isn't there, it's not up to date. So the frustrating thing is, is actually building these partnerships, uh, you know, via that rate limiting step. Mm. Okay. Paulina. 
I would say that I'm excited about the changing the uh, drug discovery process, that we can do it faster, efficiently, and probably we can move towards the personal drug discovery when you have a patient and you can do not only repurpose drug for them and optimize it uh, like um, the existing panel of drugs, but rather discover drugs from that from scratch. Maybe it will be some biological something. I think that will be definitely the area to go for. And I'm a little bit concerned about the hype generated around the, the area because once because we are right now at the peak of this hype cycle, probably this bubble is going to blow sometime soon. We know they have a lot of credible advances uh, in AI in healthcare, like uh, image analysis and probably drug discovery, one of those areas. But I hope it's not going to damage the, um, the area in a big way. And finally, George. Yes, I'm, um, I, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and say that I'm very excited about the past. And the reason I say this is because I, I really do believe that we currently have an amazing treasure of data sitting inside of our hospitals. Uh, for example, at KCH, we have 22 years of digital data about every single thing that was done to every single patient in our hospitals. So we can see in the future, which is something we cannot do now. And I really think that looking into that dirty data, creating algorithms that can explore it at scale, seeing what worked and what didn't work 20 years down the line is something that is really unique and is something that we should be looking much more into. Great. Well, thank you all very much indeed for a really interesting discussion and thank you for listening. <laughs>